Greetings, family. My name is Franz Derenicourt, Jr. I'm an author and publisher uh, with my company, Thoroughbred Books. And first, I want to say, um, uh, you know, happy RBG uh, Centennial. I'm uh, proud to be a part of this uh, conference this year. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get into my part. Uh, what I noticed uh, about studying the Honorable Marcus Garvey is, uh, you know, his relation, his close relation to the Haitian revolutionaries. Um, as a publisher and author, I mostly write about the history of the Haitian Revolution with the Haitian revolutions, uh, Haitian revolutionaries like Jean-Jacques Dessalines, uh, King Henry Christophe, Toussaint Louverture, Bukman, Mackendal, uh, and a host of others. And while, start, while studying Marcus Garvey, I couldn't help to notice the parallel in the, not only their quest for freedom uh, and individuality as a race of people, but also in the matter that they went about it. And but what I realized is that Marcus Garvey really embodied all of the Haitian revolutionaries that I've written about thus far. Uh, so what I wanted to do with my part of the presentation is kind of give you the similarities that I found between Marcus Garvey and the Haitian revolutionaries. So I just put together a quick presentation to kind of illustrate what I found to be striking resemblances between um, the Honorable Marcus Garvey and uh, some of my favorite Haitian revolutionaries. So let's just go right into it. Well, first, just to give a little bit about me, my name is Franz Derenicourt Jr. I'm an independent publisher, author. Uh, I've published four books. I've written three books uh, from about Haitian history. I have uh, Haiti, the First Black Republic, Makandal, the Black Messiah, Bukman and Cecile Fatima, Black Revolution. And I also published uh, Shiro's of the Haitian Revolution, which was written by uh, Professor Baina Bello. Uh, and most of what I do, I go, you know, on book tours. I do readings at school because because these books are illustrated and very children friendly. So, uh, you know, I share the story of the Haitian Revolution with the next generation, the youth of the world, um, so that they can be proud of something that their ancestors accomplished. Uh, there are many things to be proud of, but the Haitian Revolution is not taught uh, in most school systems. Um, but I do believe that it was a very proud moment in Black history, not just Haitian history. The Haitian Revolution was a victory for people of African descent worldwide, right? To show that we were able to stand up to oppression, uh, fight oppression and defeat oppression. Uh, and I believe that story is something that should be told over and over again. Um, so I'm just trying to do my part. Uh, but to go to this, um, what I wanted to speak on, first I'm going to try to, um, well, not try to, just kind of illustrate uh, the resemblances that I found in the quest for freedom between uh, Mackendal and Marcus Garvey. So for those who are not familiar with Mackendal, uh, and the reason I start with Mackendal is because he's one of the very first revolutionaries um, to come out of the Haitian Revolution uh, back in the mid, 18th century, so we're talking about the 1750s. Uh, Mackendal's story is very um, unique. Uh, you know, well, not unique. That's probably not the right word. Um, but he was a pioneer uh, in revolutions, uh, as far as well organized, structured, and that went on for a number of years. Uh, of course, our people were fighting. Uh, from the shores of Africa all the way <clears throat> to the plantations of America, of the Americas. 
Uh, but what stood out with me um, in the story of Makindal was that uh, not only was he a fighter, but he was able to, to gather people. He was <clears throat> a great communicator um, with uh, the people of Africa once they got to the Americas. As well, one of the things that happened that one of the things that happened in the stories of the Haitian Revolution, uh, the Maroons, Makandal, oh, what's going on with this? Why is this? All right, hold on one second. All right, I'm gonna have to edit that out. Okay. All right, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> uh, all right, so yeah, so Makandal, one of the things that I found most interesting about the story of Makandal was that he was able to unite um, a lot of the Africans uh, that were on the plantations and that were marooned. So the story of Makandal kind of goes, he was captured in Congo, Africa. He was brought over. Um, to the Americas uh, to be enslaved. And he escaped the plantations, went into the mountains, became a maroon, and he was able to unite the maroon uh, so that they were able to come together for a common cause. Uh, as you know, um, Africans from many different tribes, many different nations were brought over to be enslaved and a lot of them that marooned into the mountains to escape the plantations, um, the communication wasn't very, um, that, it wasn't that great. It wasn't uh, until Makandal was able to maroon, go into the mountains and unite them for a common cause. And the cause was to, not only to defeat slavery, but to take over the whole island, right? Defeat white supremacy uh, on the island and take over the island and create a black nation. That was his message to the Maroons and to the people of the plantation. And he put that into action. And the action that he took was to wage war on the white supremacists in Saint Domingue, which is the colonial name for Haiti. So he did that through plantation raids. He did that through uh, freeing uh, enslaved Africans. Uh, he did that through uh, a widespread conspiracy to poison the, the whole white population in Saint Domingue uh, that was enslaving his brothers and sisters. And his revolution, which started in the 17, early 1750s to late 1750s, uh, was one of the first um, well-organized revolutions. I'm not saying it was the only um, well-organized, but it was one of the first in recorded history um, that there were thousands of Maroons and people that were on the plantation that were working on one common cause, which Mackendall set the vision for. So he had, not only did he have the Maroons uh, performing Maroon raids, but he also had the enslaved Africans that were working inside of the uh, plantation houses, poisoning the white slave owners. Um, he had a number of different color um, people. Uh, he had a number of white people, um, on his team that were informants that would give him information. Uh, he had a number of people that were in the, on the plantation working for him. Um, so he was able to put together um, a, a wide amount of people, a lot of people to fight for one cause. And I believe that's what Marcus was able to do, um, even in a bigger, format <laughs> than Makanda. Uh, Marcus Garvey was able to unite millions of people, right? It was a common message, right? Uh, and 
people saw his vision and they decided to follow him because they all felt the same way, right? So I believe that Mackendall and Marcus Garvey um, had similar abilities as far as um, communication and spreading this message and also the gift of um, speaking and, and, and oratory, right? There were, Mackendall was known to be a great motivational speaker. And as you know, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, a great motivational speaker, um, spoke truth, spoke power to his people to empower his people. So uh, I believe that the similarities between Mackendall and Marcus are, are very, uh, you know, out there for everyone to see. So, uh, you know, I appreciate, uh, in fact, uh, I was watching a Marcus Garvey uh, documentary. Um, the one Marcus Garvey documentary, by the way, that's on YouTube, the one that's like about two hours long, um, I had to cut and paste it. There was a lot of people that were trying to hate on Garvey that I saw. Uh, so I took a few pieces that I liked, but there were a few pieces that I didn't really like about that documentary that I had to leave behind. But uh, I do believe that similarities between Mackendall and Marcus Garvey are pretty evident uh, as far as the way they are able to lead um, their people to spread that message and have people um, come together for a common cause, which was uh, a black nation and to defeat uh, white supremacy. Now, another revolutionary that I like to talk about, um, which I've actually written a book about, is uh, Bukman, Bukman and Cecile Fatima, The Black Revolution. This is my third book, actually. Uh, and that the this book, it's called Black Revolution, not necessarily because of the Haitian Revolution, we were able to fight back for our uh, freedom. But I chose the title Black Revolution because uh, I, believe, I believe the revolution was in the mind, right? It wasn't necessarily about um, fighting back, which it was about fighting back, but the first revolution had to happen in the mind and in the heart. Uh, you had to understand that spirituality played a big role, a huge role in our freedom. And the balance that Bukman and Cecile Fatima had together was able to, um, you know, put our people in a spiritual place. Okay. And, um, and once they were able to be centered spiritually, that's when we were able to um, defeat white supremacy in St. Domingue. So Bookman, uh, a lot of you know his story, similar to Marcus Garvey from Jamaica, right? Uh, you know, he was uh, enslaved on a plantation in Jamaica. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't know that it was actually Bookman's mother who was the major revolutionary. Uh, Bookman came over to uh, Saint Domingue at a at a young age, and it was his mother who was the rev the revolutionary. Um, and in order for the slave masters to uh, get back at the mother for causing revolutions all over Jamaica, took her son Bukman and shipped him to uh, Saint Domingue. And once he got to Saint Domingue, uh, a lot of you know Bukman has. Uh, uh, you know, the reason he was called Bukman was because of the book he carried around, which is, a, which was uh, known to be the Holy Quran. And, uh, you know, once he got to St. Domingue, he met up with the Mambo, um, Cecile Fatima, who was a voodoo priestess. Uh, they got together. Uh, Bukman became a Hugan, a voodoo priest, and they put together the first uh, Liberation Congress in St. Domingue, uh, which was called Bois Kaima, August 14, 1791, which was a spiritual ceremony with hundreds of Africans in attendance. And they pledged 
that they were once and for all going to defeat um, the enslavement of their people. And uh, they asked for the help of the ancestors and the law. And 13 years later, they were able to accomplish that. So that fine balance uh, between uh, Bukman, who was uh, the warrior and spiritual leader, and Cecil Fatima, who was actually the organizer and the, um, uh, the person who had the vision of the Bwakayima ceremony, I find that same similarity between uh, Marcus Garvey and Amy Jacques Garvey, right? Uh, they met to, uh, from what I understand, from what I know uh, and read, uh, Marcus and Amy met uh, in Jamaica. They both had a very similar philosophy as far as you know the liberation of their people and uh you know it was pretty much love at first sight even though bookman and cecile didn't was not known to have a romantic relationship but they came together they initially came together for a common cause which was um, the liberation of their people which was i believe the cause that marcus and amy came together um, and they met to Jamaica. Their relationship went all the way from Jamaica to the United States, where together they were able to form uh, and, and expand the UNIA, um, not only in the United States, but all over the world, with millions of followers. Uh, I believe that Mar uh, Amy was a huge piece um, to uh, the UNIA, and the, UN, the UNIA would not be what it is today without Amy, uh, just like how the Haitian Revolution would not be what, it, what we see it as today without Cecile Fatima. Uh, they played, both women played huge roles, uh, right? So, uh, and Amy, you know, she actually was the one that put together the uh, Philosophies and Opinions book, you know, while Marcus uh, was, uh, you know, in, in jail. Uh, she collected all of the speeches. She put, you know, pretty much put the whole book together while uh, Marcus was in prison. And, you know, that's a book that changed many people's lives. So uh, Amy played a huge role. Women played a huge role. Uh, I know when you think of, you know, RBG, UNIA, Marcus Garvey, um, you know, he's such a huge figure that, but you have to understand, well, for me, I, something that I understand is that there's no complete revolution or you can't accomplish um, the things that Marcus accomplished without the help of women, period, right? And the fact that he had Amy Jacques Garvey, you know, uh, at his side, uh, pretty much, you know, guarding him, not only putting things together for him, but trying to keep him safe, like, uh, you know, trying to throw assassination attempts and stuff like that. You know, there, there is no Marcus Garvey without Amy Shop. Um, and I could say that wholeheartedly. So the relationship between Bukman and Cecile Fatima, uh, I found in the relationship uh, with Marcus and Amy Shop was that nothing that uh, we see today that they accomplished. Um, we, I know we, we look at Bookman, we look at Marcus as individuals, but they were not able to accomplish what they were able to accomplish without the women that helped them accomplish it. Um, in this case, Cecile Fatima and Amy Jacques. Now this one, <laughs> uh, well, when I first um, talked to Brother Omawali, uh, this presentation was just supposed to be the similarities that I found between Dessaline and Jean-Jacques Dessaline and Marcus Garvey. For those who are unfamiliar with Jean-Jacques Dessaline, Jean-Jacques Dessaline was the uh, pretty much the first chief of state of independent Haiti, right? Dessaline, after Toussaint Louverture, um, who pretty much guided the Haitian Revolution all the way up to his um, capture uh, by the French in 1802. Jean-Jacques Dessalines stepped in and finished 
the war against the French and created an independent Haiti. Um, and uh, for those that's unfamiliar with his story, uh, Dessalines, you know, came, was enslaved, you know, as a youth, uh, 1791. He joined the liberation effort uh, in the war against the, you know, in the rebellions against the French, uh, which turned into a revolution. And ultimately, he was able to uh, put the final blow, deal the final blow to the French uh, expedition that came under the rule of Napoleon, uh, defeated Napoleon's army, and on January 1st, 1804, declared an independent Haiti. Um, and all, after independence, um, you know, he was very instrumental in, I mean, when we say, I know sometimes when we talk about Black nations today, and we mention the word independence, it comes with, you know, uh, quotes, independence, because if, when you're given your independence by a colonizer, um, it comes with asterisks. Right? They still control the education. They still control the economy. They still control the resources. Right? In the case of IET, that was not the case. Right? Dessalines wanted a completely independent Haiti. And that's what he strove for. That's what he believed in. That's what he preached. And that's what he did um, for the time that he was in power. He was assassinated uh, a few years after his inauguration as the first chief of state of Haiti, January 1st, 1804, uh, which was the Haitian Independence Day. Uh, he was assassinated uh, shortly thereafter in 1806. But the vision that he laid out for Haiti was to be a completely independent country. And, uh, and he wanted the citizens of Haiti uh, to be to be dependent on their own hard work, right? So Marcus Garvey, uh, from, what I, from what I know, was very familiar with the Haitian Revolution. Uh, in fact, uh, I have this illustration over here of uh, Dessalines in his bicorn hat, and you see uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey there with his bicorn hat, military uniform. I believe, I haven't read anywhere that he adopted um, this type of uniform from Jean-Jacques Dessalines, but just looking at these two illustrations, you can, you can see that he was inspired um, by Jean-Jacques Dessalines, um, by his vision, um, by his uh, leadership abilities, uh, and pretty much by his philosophy. Right, and I believe Marcus was able to take that to the next level. Dessalines accomplished a lot. Dessalines accomplished something that no other black man will probably, uh, well, no other black man has been able to accomplish to this date as far as bringing the feeding uh, through combat, military combat, three white superpowers. Right, France, Spain, and England, okay? So you have to understand that that's a huge accomplishment. Um, Marcus also has a huge accomplishment uniting millions of Africans around the world, okay? Not just in the United States. So um, there were the, the similarities. Uh, I believe Marcus strove to be um, like Dessalines, I understand that Marcus Garvey um, wanted to be a complete independent, I want, he wanted the race to be completely independent, right? Um, he wanted to create the people of, of high affairs. He wanted to create um, Black people um, that had important posts, important positions. Uh, you know, so that they can be completely independent. He wanted his own land, right, in Africa, where he would be able to create his own commerce, right? He wanted uh, land in Africa so that he could extract raw materials and have their own manufacturing. Uh, this is exactly what Dessalines wanted, 
right? This is what Dessalines strove for. And Marcus was actually in the process of creating all of this um, before, you know, white supremacy uh, conspired against him to take him down. Uh, so the similarities in nation building, um, striving for independence between Marcus Garvey and Jean-Jacques Dessalines are striking. And I believe Marcus, uh, you know, was a, was a, well, Marcus was a scholar. So I know he knows, he knew about the Haitian revolution and its leaders, uh, in particular, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. So I believe he did adopt his vision as, uh, as far as creating a nation of, their, of our own and being completely independent with no involvement of colonizers. So I, I salute uh, Marcus Garvey, I salute Jean-Jacques Dessalines uh, for bringing that vision to life and, and pushing that vision forward uh, so that today in 2020, that we're able to have uh, you know, a precedent uh, as far as two black men who were able to uh, pretty much put their vision uh, into reality for us to show us that it is possible and it will be possible one day. Uh, so I salute these two canes. Now, King Henry, <laughs> King Henry and Marcus Mosiah, uh, I believe that there are similarities uh, between these two as well. Now, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with King Henry, this is the King Henry that I acknowledge, all right? Um, this is the Haitian revolutionary Henry Christophe, uh, an amazing story, okay? For those who are not familiar with uh, Henry Christophe, I suggest a few books where you can read about him. Uh, one is uh, Black Majesty. Uh, one is King, I believe it's just called King Henry. Yeah, yeah King Henry, uh, I believe is the name of the book, but don't quote me on that. But definitely Black Majesty is a must read, uh, which is the life of Henry Christophe. Um, originally from Grenada, uh, emigrated to Haiti, or Saint Domingue, colonial Haiti, um, and 1790. Well, he actually Henry Christophe uh, participated in the Battle of Savannah in um, in Georgia, in uh, the United States during the American Revolution. Uh, as a youth, he was a drummer boy, uh, and then went back to colonial Haiti, Saint Domingue. And in 17, he was uh, pretty much, he was an entrepreneur his whole career. Uh, he ran a hotel in Haiti, St. Domingue. And in 1791, uh, he joined the, the rebels, right? And started fighting back against uh, the white slavers of the colony and was able with the, at the side of Jean-Jacques Dessalines to send l'ouverture uh, was able to bring Haiti to independence. And he was you know, a general, he was one of the main leaders of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, after the death of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the assassination of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, um, uh, Henry, uh, I'm sorry, pretty much Haiti went into a civil war. Uh, it was Henry Christophe who was able, who controlled the north of Haiti and Alexander Pétion, who controlled the south of Haiti, like the west and south. Um, but the, mo the mass majority of the land was in the north, which was controlled by Henry, King Henry. So, well, he wasn't king yet, Henry Christophe. Uh, so they were trying to, after the death of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, um, Henry Christophe and Alexander Pétion uh, did not see eye to eye. Um, they started battling against each other. Uh, eventually, a huge civil war broke out. This is after the death of Jean-Jacques Dessalines. So this is 1806, 1807, circa 1806, 1807. So Jean-Jacques De um, Henry Christophe, Alexander Petro don't see eye to eye. They go to battle against each other and eventually retreat to their own territories. Um, under Toussaint Louverture, Henry Christophe was general 
uh, of the northern armies. Uh, so once Toussaint was um, captured and deported to France and eventually killed in France, uh, Dessalines took over. Uh, Christophe kept his role as you know general of the north. Um, well, most powerful in the north uh, after the assassination of Dessalines. So Christophe pretty much becomes the pretty much the all powerful, uh, especially of the black population in the north. Uh, they don't see eye to eye with the south, which is pretty much mulatto controlled by Alexander Pétion. They have a civil war. Then now um, there's pretty much two Hades, the north of Haiti, um, which King Henry eventually became uh, turned into a kingdom, right? So uh, he created Haitian currency. Um, he had a navy. He created a navy of over 200 ships, mostly for commerce, to do commerce with the rest of the world. Um, not only did he mint Haitian currency, he minted currency for other nations as well. He created trade relationships with dozens of countries. Um, and the north of Haiti under King Henry Christophe was a very rich nation, right? He developed schools. He developed, um, well, schools, number one, churches, um, well, you know, spirituality, churches, uh, and, he built one of the largest fortresses in the world, the largest of the Western Hemisphere, which is uh, Citadel Henry. Uh, and he had a very clear vision of what he wanted Haiti to be, right? Uh, and I believe that Marcus Mosiah Garvey had that same vision um, for what he wanted uh, the Black people of the world to be. Uh, and it was based in economics, right? That wasn't Marcus Garvey's sole um, achievement or sole goal was just base, uh, basing everything in economics, but he understood how important that was. Marcus Garvey was an astute businessman, okay? Um, as you're talking about all different types of businesses, printing presses, uh, laundromats, restaurants, uh, man, I can't even name all the dozens and dozens of businesses that Marcus Messiah Garvey was able to found under the UNIA. Um, and of course, the Black Star Line, where he wanted a fleet of ships, where he actually purchased three ships um, for commerce, to have commerce all over the world, Africa, the Caribbean, to get raw materials, have manufacturing plants to develop those materials, he wanted to be completely self-sufficient, which is something King Henry was able to do for a number of years, from 1806 all the way to 1820, um, when, when he died. Um, he created a, a very rich nation in the north of Haiti, and I believe Marcus Messiah Garvey was on his way to accomplishing the same exact thing, um, especially with his vision for the Black Star Line, that was huge. Uh, once I read that he was, he actually purchased ships, and I'm not, and this is 1919, right, 1920. I don't remember the exact date of the Black Star Line on the first purchase of um, his his first ship, but you're talking about early 20th century, 1919, 1920, 1921. Um, that's huge for a black person to purchase a ship for to have worldwide commerce for black people, black owned. Uh, and that's something that King Henry did. He had over a fleet of over 200 ships. And I believe um, without the interference of um, uh, white supremacy, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, you know, J. Edgar Hoover um, having uh, spies all throughout the UNIA, sabotaging the Black Star Line ships, uh, sabotaging 
the, the books, sabotaging every step of the way, making the Black Star Line fail, right? Uh, I believe without any of that interference, oh, and not to mention the informants that were working for the FBI, Black informants that were working for the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover. Well, J. Edgar Hoover was very young back then, but um, he was, that was one of, Marcus Garvey was one of his first targets of his career and um, sabotaged everything that the UNIA was trying to uh, accomplish. So, uh, and with, the, with these illustrations, I mean, you can see how Marcus Garvey and these Haitian revolutionaries are similar, not in the way that they try to go about black liberation, black economics, um, black freedom. But I mean, look at their uh, poses, right? I don't think it's by accident, right? I believe Marcus Garvey, Marcus Messiah Garvey, the honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey uh, was very well aware of the Haitian revolutionaries, their accomplishments, what they strove for, what they envisioned for Black people all around the world. Um, and not only that, but what they put into action. Marcus Garvey, to me, was a man of action, right? He spoke it, but he walked it as well. Uh, and that's something that a lot of us would, you know, uh, well, me especially, um, not only speaking freedom, speaking liberation, but actually taking those steps to get my people there. And that's what these two, King Henry, Christoph, Marcus Messiah Garvey, um, I respect them a lot for doing that and giving us a vision of what can be accomplished, um, even in the face of the enemy. Right. Of course, Marcus was, Marcus was sabotaged every step of the way, but even with that, he was able to accomplish so much, right? And, and give us a blueprint of what we could accomplish once we get together, when we come together. I mean, it, it's limitless, right? Limitless what we can accomplish. So I appreciate uh marcus <laughs> I, I like looking at this illustration with christoph and, and and garvey uh very similar just like the desaline and uh with the bike horn hat and garvey with the bike horn hat uh it, you know he embodied to me he embodied every part of each of those haitian revolutionaries that i mentioned uh, from Makindal to bukman to Dessalines, to King Henry. He embodied all three of, all four of them at the same time, right? And was able to accomplish so much um, using everything that those Haitian revolutionaries stood for and what he was able to accomplish. And um, it's just a shame that it was brought to an end, but um, the, the new RBG movement the the new UNIA movement um, and with this centennial celebration uh, of the RBG uh, I believe that we are going to spark that next generation of Garveyites and um, you know we're going to have some great leaders come out of it so uh, I believe that's it for me I'm not gonna hold sorry this is a recording I would love to take questions but um, you could reach me if you have any questions about this uh, presentation uh, on my website, which is thoroughbredbooks.com. Uh, you know, you can also take a look at some of my books there. Uh, you know, these are my four books that I published. I wrote the first three, Haiti, Makindal, Bukman, and uh, Shiro's of the Haitian Revolution, uh, written by Bayina Bello and illustrated by Curve and Andre. Um, you know, take a look at the website, uh, shoot me an email, uh, let me know what you think of this presentation, and uh, hopefully we can link up in the future. All right, so hopefully you guys enjoy this, and um, man, take care, peace and blessings, and 
RBG, red, black, and green, UNIA. Let's go, next generation. It's in your hands. Peace.